location and we're here at ColossalCon 2013 with Mela Lee. Hi guys. How did you get started in the world of entertainment? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I got lucky. Um, I was working at a bank, Wall Street Mortgage Bankers, and uh, I lost my job. And then a friend of mine, Joe Capaletti, uh, was doing ADR for film and television and called me that weekend and asked if I could script some investment banking copy um, because I had done a little bit of anime and um, at the time, I didn't, I can't support myself on it, so I had done some anime, but all of a sudden, between voiceover, ADR for the film and television industry, and several of my series took off in anime, and I had a new job that my parents even approved of. It was pretty great. All right. Uh, now, you are the voice of Rin Tosaka mm -hmm. in the anime series Fate. Um, did you know about her overarching connections within the timeline of the series? Uh, did that have any effects on your performance? Um, I didn't when we first started. Uh, I didn't know anything about the series when they first cast me. Um, and then obviously uh, got into the manga and uh, was seeing how much that would cross over and um, I'm now doing Fate Zero. And it's, it's the first time I've, I've been able to go back and do a young version of the same character. She's one of the few that, that's still the same soul. Like She's immortal so um, I got to be me and, and the rest of the cast changed over. But it's really been exciting. Awesome. Uh, a newer show that you uh, worked on is uh, Nura, Rise of the Yokai Clan. Uh, what experience did you gain from it and being able to have such a wonderful cast to play off of? Um, well, the best part about having a great cast is when we come to conventions, we get to hang out. Because when we're actually recording, we're not in the room together. Um, Tony Oliver is the director and one of my absolute favorite human beings on the planet. So, um, although I love coming to conventions and, and, and talking with my friends that we get to do more series with, uh, it's really wonderful to work with Tony. Um, he's just a great director and a, and a pretty awesome human being. No, it, was, it was really fun being able to speak with him about like Super Sentai and Power Rangers a few months ago when I got the chance to speak with him. Um, now, I've read you've done sound design for movies. Uh, what's that experience like? What's the process entail? Um, well, basically some of it's ADR, which is um, post-recording, when you're, you're filling in um, uh, people's, it, maybe the boom mic didn't pick up uh, a, a series, or somebody had sort of a flat performance and they want you to beef it up a little. But some of the exciting things we've done uh, in post, like for Pirates of the Caribbean, um, would be creating sound design for the mermaids and, and creating a world. Um, we did Warm Bodies recently, um, and we had to go in several times to create what the, the zombies would sound like. They wanted a kinder, gentler zombie, so they wanted them, instead of having that typical moan, to have a musical sound even. So they hired a lot of, of singers so that when we moaned it was you could tell the difference between the good zombies and the bad zombies. And, um, so it's a really creative process, but what's exciting is you're at Sony or Warner Brothers and it kind of never wears off when you drive onto the lot and you get your pass and they drive you to a, an amazing sound stage and you get to be one of the first people that sees the movie, the director's cut, and, before anybody else. And that never wears off. Like that's, It's Hollywood and you, you're in the middle of making movies. It's really awesome. Wonderful. Uh, now it says you've composed the theme song for Saturday Night Live's Seven Minutes in Heaven. Um, <laughs> how did uh, that door open for you? Well, one of my writing partners is Alexander Burke, and um, he was one of the youngest uh, music directors for Second City in Chicago. And so he was working with uh, Amy Poehler, Rachel Dratch, um, Jason Sudeikis, and, and P.O.B., Mike O'Brien. Um, his nickname's P.O.B., Patrick O'Brien. And Mike is one of the senior writers for uh, SNL and, and did the Seven Minutes in Heaven um, series. And it was about one o'clock in the morning, and Alex and I were next door neighbors at the time. And he said, hey, uh, you know, Mike's doing a new series. He needs a theme song. And I thought maybe you'd like to sing on it, you know, because we're going to submit some ideas. And I said, wow, that's really Grace, one o'clock in the morning, and and he says, well, I'd love to have you come in and, and do a few ideas, and I said, great, and he goes, now, <laughs> I was in my pajamas, so uh, I walked over, and and he says, what about if it was just like this '50s? Can you you know think of something? And it was like, but I da 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 seven minutes in heaven, oh yeah, and he goes, that's great, and then he did like a a harp sign at the end. He said, I'll submit it. And the next morning, he said, they loved it. It'll be great. And I said, great, we'll record it, you know, tonight, like really record it. He goes, no, no, they're just going to use that one. So that's the original two o'clock in the morning, one take, and it ended up being the theme for the, the, the show. It's so beautiful when you get that bullseye on the first try. Yeah. 
We had no idea. I think that's important to note. Sometimes you, you self-censor or you decide that, that uh, you, you could do better, but usually it's that first take that's got that, that edge to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, now, as we just heard, you're also a singer. Uh, what drives you, what compels you to um, perform vocally? Well, I, I always like to sing, like, doing dishes or in the shower, but um, and a little bit in church. Uh, but when I lost my job on Wall Street, I had some free time and something I'd always wanted to do. My father died when I was a little girl, and my mother remarried. So I used some of my severance to go to Mississippi and Louisiana and visit family and and find out where he liked to go and who his friends were. And I got to actually meet him as a man, you know, when they would tell these stories about his favorite music and, and, and his favorite bar. And I was writing these stories down in a journal I'd bought at the side of the road. And it had magnolias on it, so I called it the Magnolia Memoir. And I was waking up with music in my head, and I thought I'd like to record them, you know, with a live band, just maybe uh, to, to kind of honor this, this beautiful trip. Not really thinking past that. And then Bruce Springsteen's engineer heard them and Aretha Franklin's people and, and they, they made this amazing session for the band and we got to record our first album live and it's, it's really extraordinary. And we got a publishing deal shortly after that and I kind of fell into the music industry and so I think my father is that definitely that, that genesis point and kind of laying on his grave and he was really poor and he was 30 when he died and his family didn't save up for uh, a gravestone. So when my uncle took me to where he was buried, it was at the side of a country road in um, the Panhandle of Florida, and he kind of went off the road, and there was this pauper's field where the the um, gravestones are about this big, and they're hand etched, and um, it was really small, I remember, and 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 I kind of was weeping, you know, I had never visited his grave, and and my uncle was like, well, you're his stone. When people ask me whatever happened to Johnny, I say you, like what became of him. And I think this music career is really that kind of legacy to remember what an extraordinary guy he was. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, now, acting and singing uh, seem to be very, two very helpful things uh, when applied to your voice work. Um, how do you feel that all of these methods of performance uh, build upon each other and supplement each other? Well, in anime, it's, it's very much a musical process, um, especially with some of the production houses I work with. They want to stay with the music of the, the original Japanese, and so there's a rhythm to, to the delivery, and, and we want to, of course, make it make sense in English, but honor um, the music of the Japanese. And, and so they'll, sometimes even the directors will tell you, can you change the music a little and kind of go up here, and here's the rhythm. And um, I think it, it helps you, especially in voice matching, because everyone has a music to their voice. So when you are doing a southern person or someone from South Africa, there's a, a music and a rhythm to the voice. So it definitely helps out. And then in games, um, especially if you're not human and they want you to create this like extraordinary whistle tone or, or there's this playground in your voice that you're able to um, create alien sounds. and. I don't know, all of a sudden the eight-year-old in you is just like, what? This is a job? This is amazing! And you get to really play. So I, I think you know, acting obviously helps, but I, I think music and, and being able to utilize your voice is, is really key. I guess that's what we're voice actors. All right. Um, now, are there any other upcoming projects that you're capable of discussing at the moment? I like how you say capable. Uh, <laughs> I just did a game and I tweeted about it and then somebody texted me while I was in, in the session and the engineer was like, by the way, you're not supposed to tell anybody about anything. And I guess they'd seen the tweet. I was like, deleting now. <laughs> But for those of you that are fans of some of my bigger games, um, three of them have new franchise uh, or new installments that are coming out in the next few months. Um, and you know we've talked about Nur is obviously out and, and Fate Zero. Um, we've got three of the games coming out. And Magnolia Memoir, my band, is um, we just finished our third album, and that'll be out in the fall as well. Right. Wonderful. Do you have any other final words to get to the fans out there watching? Um, well, thank you for watching. Uh, I, I don't know what would make you watch more, but i just like to say thank you. I, I mean, five years ago I had lost my job. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and uh, I was kind of on the verge of bankruptcy, which is not something you want to tell your parents. I didn't have to file, and um, it was because of my work in voice acting. 
and to be able to travel to London and Australia and New Zealand and, and Ohio, <laughs> which is actually extraordinarily beautiful. Um, Cleveland Rocks is a song, but we should have like Kalahari Rocks. Definitely Colossal Con is, it's extraordinary. If you haven't been and if you're not here now, you have to come next year. It, it almost dwarfs Comic Con in San Diego. It's awesome. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you. It's an extraordinary life and um, it's as amazing as it seems and I really owe it to the fans for watching the shows and supporting me and coming to the conventions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. You're very welcome. All right. Mela Lee, everybody.